It was a battle that Poland was not supposed to have won. A David and Goliath battle so pivotal, yet so criminally overlooked in the shadows between two world wars. If Poland lost, it would mean the end of its short-lived independence. But for the rest of Europe, a Soviet victory could have changed the history of the entire continent immensely. Today we look at the 1920 Battle of Warsaw, or as it's known in Polish, Cud nad Wisłą, the miracle on the Vistula. In the year 1795, Poland had failed in its resistance against the major powers on its borders, leading to the country's partition between the Kingdom of Austria, Prussia and the Russian Empire. Poland was completely erased from the map for 123 years. In the space of five generations, you would expect anyone else to just give up and relinquish their statehood. But this is Poland we're talking about. And as the national anthem states, Poland is not yet lost, so long as we still live. Europe would eventually see another major shake-up in the early 20th century, specifically a little event known as the Great War, later known as World War I. As you may know, Germany and Austro-Hungary were on the losing side, and Russia's participation was disrupted by the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917. Polish resilience had finally paid off, and the Second Polish Republic emerged in 1919. As German troops withdrew from the Eastern Front in what is today Belarus and Ukraine, the new Polish army, led by Chief of State Josef Pilsudski, quickly mobilised to fill the vacuum and reclaim its former territories. But the Bolsheviks now in power in Russia were not ready to give up their former territories so easily. Much more, in fact. They were determined in spreading the communist revolution westward. And as it's often been in history, Poland is the bridge between East and West. The Red Army was mobilised to push back the Polish front and concentrated all its forces towards the capital of Warsaw. Thus began the Polish-Soviet War in 1919. Pilsudski was successful in capturing the city of Kiev on May 9th, 1920, while supporting the dwindling forces of the Ukrainian People's Republic. However, by mid-June, Polish forces were forced to evacuate, and Soviet forces rolled forward. Falling back from the Belarusian territories in the north, Pilsudski used the retreat to reorganise and make preparations for the oncoming Russian offensive. He knew their objective was Warsaw, so that's where he'd meet them. Crossing over the Vistula in early August of 1920, he began fortifying the bridgeheads along the river. The Polish 5th Army was placed to the city's north, in and around the Modlin Fortress. To Warsaw's east, the Polish 1st Army was entrenched as the city's last line of defence. This position was to be held at all costs. Further down the line held by the 2nd Army, the Polish 3rd and 4th Armies were placed to the city south, awaiting Pilsudski's counter-offensive. Leading the Russian offensive was Commander Mikhail Tukashevsky. Привет. The core of Tukashevsky's strategy was to encircle Warsaw from the northwest, the same way that Russian forces had done during the November Uprising of 1831. Simultaneously, he would send the Russian 16th Army to attack the city from the east, while the 12th Army and 1st Cavalry would eventually breach Warsaw from the south. But Pilsudski was well aware of these plans, thanks to Polish cryptologists who had broken the Russian ciphers. But regardless of the advantage, the Poles were going up against a far more advanced army, with more experienced commanders. Josef Pilsudski was better known as a politician, and had no formal military education. So the cynics and military observers predicted a decisive Soviet victory. A miracle would indeed be required. And so the Battle of Warsaw began. On August 12th, Tukashevsky sent the Russian 16th Army to attack the city's defences from the east, focusing their efforts on the town of Rajmin. At the same time, he concentrated the 3rd, 4th and 15th Armies on the northern front to begin his surrounding manoeuvre. Rajmin was eventually captured by the Red Army on August 14th, forcing the Polish 1st Army back towards the Vistula. This added more pressure to the Polish northern line, as it continued to resist the attack of three whole Russian armies. Things were not looking good for the Poles, but as the name of this video would suggest, a miracle was about to take place. At midnight on the 14th, the Polish 203rd Ulan Regiment broke through the Russians' northern line and managed to sabotage a radio tower being used to coordinate Soviet troops. They did this by transmitting conflicting Morse code over the same frequency. 
But they didn't just choose any old text. They recited the book of Genesis in Polish and Latin. How very Polish. Due to the disruption in communication, the Russian 4th Army missed the command to turn south and continued advancing west. It was now August 15th, the Feast of the Assumption in the Catholic religious calendar. As if motivated by a divine force, the Polish 5th Army pushed forward from their position and forced the Russian Frank back away from the Vistula. Pilsudski had long realised the gravity of the situation and he handed in a letter of resignation from all state duties so that the government would not be disrupted in the event of his death. On August 16th, he began the Polish counter-offensive, personally leading the 3rd and 4th Polish armies northwards. They steamrolled over the measly defences of the Mazur group, leaving the Russian flank completely exposed, as well as cutting off communication and supply lines to the Russian 16th army. As confusion ensued, the Russian commander ordered a general fallback and regroup but it was ineffective. At this point, Tukhashevsky was still hoping for the Russian 12th Army and 1st Cavalry to advance on Warsaw from the southeast. But the commanding generals of these units had been in disagreement with Tukhashevsky on his overall strategy, and ultimately these orders were ignored. The Russian 1st Cavalry ultimately chose to ride on the city of Lviv, a manoeuvre that was encouraged by a young Joseph Stalin who was seeking his own political gain. Without support from the southeast, Tukhashevsky was ultimately left to face defeat on his own. By August 18th, Russian forces had effectively been defeated, but it would take until August 21st for a full retreat from Warsaw to be issued. The Russian 4th Army, cut off from the main force, retreated into East Prussia, and all 35,000 soldiers were taken prisoner. But that was just the start. Total Russian losses during the engagement have been estimated at 126,000. That's compared to just 40,500 on the Polish side. Bolshevik leader Vladimir Lenin admitted to the enormous defeat, and with the Red Army in full retreat, Pilsudski was able to mobilise his troops again and eventually solidify the Republic's borders by March 1921. Whether it was good luck, divine intervention, poor discipline in Soviet leadership, talented Polish code breakers, or an impromptu recital of the Book of Genesis in Morse code, Pilsudski had effectively stopped Soviet expansion into Western Europe. If Poland had not succeeded in halting the Soviet advance, it's very possible that European history would have taken a very different turn. It's unlikely that countries like Germany, Hungary and Romania would be able to hold out against the advancing Bolsheviks. In this alternate history, would Germany ever see the rise of fascism in a communist state? As we know, Poland would be again invaded by the Soviet Union in 1939, as well as Nazi Germany from the West. But the question should be asked, in an alternate history, would there even be a Poland to conquer? And would a Polish defeat in 1920 be the last spark of resistance and the pursuit of self-determination? Because we at In Your Pocket can't imagine a world without Poland, we say, not a chance. So long as there are Poles, there will always be a Poland.